Hello, folks, and welcome. Vinny Caggiano, eclectic guitarist here, and with my good friend, uh, uh, James Corbett. Hello. Uh, you can tell the difference between the two of us because he has better video quality and mine is crappy video quality, so there we go. <laughs> and uh, we're going to... What are we doing tonight, James? What are we What are we going for? Uh, so we are on the next uh, uh, issue of the Beatles discography the real discography the parlophone one so we are now at beatles for sale and we are on no reply we're going to do no reply today because there's lots you know what beatles for sale has a bad rap doesn't it it's not one of the uh indeed yeah i mean mm -hmm. but actually listening to it it's not a bad album if you go into it expecting a bad album you'd be pleasantly surprised i think because there's some good songs in here well, you know, Beatles had a lot of what I call half albums. They're yeah. kind of, yeah, you I, know, that's what I call it. It's a half album. Half of it's pretty good. Yeah, and then half of it. You right. can always find a nugget of of perfection in, in in any Beatles record. There's at least one or two truly great songs in every single record. And so, this is one of them, yeah. right? This is one of them. So, uh, so in other words, we're scrapping our analysis of the uh, box branding for concertos to do the uh, no uh, reply. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, I guess so. Bach. <laughs> what did he know? We'll do. Beatles. Yeah, Bach. You know, so passe anyway. You know. <laughs> Get with the times, man. Bach. Bach is so 17th century or 18th, whatever it was. Okay. So, um, I, the song is no reply, and James, you are. Uh, the producer here, I suppose. So, in other words, uh, why don't you give our listeners a taste of what the song sounds like? Of course, it being a cover version because the UMG Corporation will not let us play actual Beatles tracks. No. Um, so, this is a cover by the Mersey Beatles. It was filmed at Penny Lane Development Trust, whatever that is, on Saturday, mm -hmm. the 25th of August, 2012. So, let's listen to the first verse. This happened once before I came to your door No reply They said it wasn't you But I saw you be through No, no I saw the light I saw the light I know that you saw me As I looked up to see Okay. Et cetera. So that is, a, that is a full verse, and it was gonna, about to go into the next verse. There's a bridge which we'll come up to later, okay? But first now, let's talk about um, the verse, and I'm sure it very naturally will flow into the bridge at some point. So one thing to note right off the bat is this song begins with what's called a pickup, a melody line that happens before the actual downbeat occurs. Da-da-da-da-da-da, right? Um, and, you know, it's interesting because it's purely just the vocal, right? There's no other instrument. And by the way, noteworthy is the fact that it has no intro. It's just, boom, right into the song, right? And can I just make an observation? I think uh, that's... Observe like the wind. I think that's very John. A lot of his songs, when you think about it, either start right on the downbeat or there's no intro or he, there's a pickup. A lot of his songs... Oh, I never noticed that before. You know what I was going to ask you? Well, how many Beatles songs start like that with a vocal and then the band comes in? You know, that, that's oh, yeah. an interesting thought. Yeah. I, yeah, I'd be hard-pressed to think off the top of my head, but I know a lot of John songs, if you think about it, start on right away. There's no intro. Uh, that kind of almost describes his nature in a way, you know, kind of impulsive and, you know, yeah. But it would be an interesting kind of like now I listen to Beatles records. I'm going to I'm going to have an ear for, OK, as any of these songs start with just the vocal and then the band comes in. How about. So, uh, yeah. It, am I am I wrong? Girl. Is there anybody right. is there? Yeah, it's a that could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's very John. Again, you're right on the money with that. Nice, James. Nice. Uh, picked up on yeah. on that. No, very nice. It. Think about it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm going to think about it, actually. Um, all right, so um, the melody, da, da. Now, first of all, the chord progression is 1, 4, 5, but here's another oddity. A lot of songwriters, if I'm in the key of C, right, this song is in C, a lot of songwriters will start on the C chord. Right, right. Right? But 
This song starts on the F chord. The four. But, the four chord um, key. Okay, hold on. I'm just thinking off the top of my head. But d does that pickup imply, sort of, is there an implied C from that imaginary measure that's happening before the down, first downbeat? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. Because when you think of the next line, it's going to be on the... Da -da 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 Da, 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 right. da, da, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, it does kind of imply the C. Uh, yeah, yeah, it does. But since the F is on the downbeat itself, I'd be inclined to say that it's actually, it really, really is starting on the F chord, you know. Um, because even, you know, bear in mind that when he repeats the melody, da, 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 You can hear it beginning on the F chord. All right, so yeah, so it's it's a bona fide, uh, yeah. Now, uh, yeah, one observation I made is this: first, well, let's look at the big picture, the whole form first. Okay, we'll get to the bridge uh, more specifically, but I'm going to mention the bridge now, and I have my handy. And by the way, folks, I am. I am kind of flying by the seat of my pants. I, I kind of researched this today, and uh, because I've been sick, you know, I don't know if it's coronavirus, but I've definitely been sick. And uh, I, I, up till this morning, I emailed James. I said, I'm not sure I'm going to do the show. I was feeling awful yesterday, but I feel fine today. So here's my handy dandy whiteboard. And let's see, we have the chord progression F. G, C. Don't mind the little sixes yet. Uh, so, I'm sorry, I'm missing. Yeah, the first one is F, G, C. Then the next one is F, G, C. Then the big dramatic part, and then F, G, C again. So we have within the verse an A, A, B, A structure. All put together, we call that whole chunk an A. Does that make sense? That's one verse. So the entirety of the song is so concise. A, one big chunk. A, another big chunk. The bridge. A, another big chunk. And then you're out. That's it. And that was like really an earmark of the Beatles before they got more self-indulgent, is that they were so capable of giving you so much within two minutes of music. You know, got to hand it to them. So that's the overview, the big overview, the big fat AABA -A -A is the, the entire form of the song. Um, so one thing I want to mention first is like looking at the melody. What I found interesting was the little ending tag of each line, like da 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 comes in and you hear how final that last one is it's like okay statement made it's wrapped up you know but which is interesting about uh, what he does is John had a penchant for forgetting things mostly lyrics but in this case I think he, he might have kind of I don't know if this was written to the song but the only time you hear that's the only time you hear that line in the first verse. It never comes up later. Later, he uses that. Remember that last song, uh, line? Da, da, da. Well, instead of putting it at the end, he puts it on the second one. So it's da, 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 Instead of he's not going to use that that ending uh, again, he, you know. Before he used it on the third phrase, now he used it on the second phrase, and all he does to end it off is and the final one. Da -da -da -da. Da -da 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 -da. 
I can't really sing it, but it's. So that's an interesting little thing, you know, any that. Uh, do you think that was a, like a choice or that he was making? I thought it was probably just lyrically determined. I, I, I you know, I thought it might have been based on the lyrics and how the melody yeah. flowed with the sound of right. the, of the uh, words, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, that 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 will remain forever a mystery. Nobody will ever know, <laughs> you know, what what his intention was in that moment. But um who cares? It's freaking the Beatles, and mm. it's awesome. Yeah. You know? Okay. But uh, why? What makes it awesome? What's the sixes about, anyway? All right. So, I when I emailed you, James, I said, you know, we've got to look for a decent cover version. And one complaint I had was that none of the bands, not a single one of them, played um, the two guitar parts. And I listened closely and I figured out, it, it took me a second to, to geek this out because, all right, each one of the, the, one, the uh, F chord, the G chord, and the C chord even has a six in it. Now, what a six is, if you count up from the root of the chord, one, two, three, four, five, six, you get that note. So if I do a C chord, da, stick that in there, right? For an F, I count up from the root F. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then same on the G chord. Oh. So I kept hearing these six ringing, and I thought, all right, first I thought this. Right? you'd have to be really careful because if you, the little space between these two fingers throws in the seventh, and that is not the intention. The intention is, right? So I thought, well, they couldn't have been doing that. They, then I thought of the jazz form, which a jazz guitarist would be more likely to do. And I thought, were they really that advanced? And I thought, wait a second. Lennon was a working class guitar player. He was like, bar chords, you know. So then I, I put on the headphones and listened real close, and I figured it out. George Harrison, against the F chord, played a D minor chord. When you, Right? So when you play it, I can't really physically do it, but I'll see if I can. I can't. Um, the closest I could come is... Right, so the D minor laid over the F. Now, how could that possibly work? You know, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's not what's called in classical music polytonality because why? Because there's a close relationship between this F chord and this D minor chord that Harrison is laying over. Do you know what it is, James? Well, like specifically, uh, uh, it, I'm assuming it's the uh, the one six relationship, and if we're thinking of the key of F, right? Yes, indeed. It's the major, major. right? And, and, and yeah, like, as a working class guitar player, I can attest to that because it's it's very easy to go from the F to the D minor, and I've noticed, oh, you know that that works. They're they're, they're related chords, right. clearly. And you know, looking closely at the instrument, if I, if I just choose these three notes right here, the notes are A, C, and F. A D minor is A, D, and F. So there are two notes in common between both chords. Therefore, it's such a close relationship. So I figured out Harrison's part was. And if you put that over, you get this combination. What I was a little disappointed in is sometimes he just plays a straight C. And I think back in the, you know how, how George was in those days, he'd forget things and screw up, you know? Uh, so I think sometimes he just forgot to put the six in the C chord. Like he just went like this instead of. But if you listen closely, you'll hear that, that high six in the C. It happens less on the C chord. It always happens on the F and the G, but not, on the, uh, not always on the C. It's kind of arbitrary the way it comes up. So there's that. 
Uh, thank you for bringing that to my conscious attention, because obviously I've heard that, but I've never thought about it. And you're exactly right. That is a key part of the sound of this song. But it's not, mm -hmm. yeah, not something I've consciously registered. And very much in that almost campy, like really straddling on campy Beatles sound. Six chords are dorky. They yeah. really got to be careful. With I them, always, right? always, always bring it back. I, I always hear Hawaiian kind of sound when I hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but but it, it, I, that's not the sense I get in this context. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they don't throw it in your face either. You know, that's the thing. It's very subtle when you hear that sixth. It, it, very subtle, but I absolutely heard it. No question about it. And I was really happy when I figured out, oh, he used the D minor against the F, the E minor against the uh, G, and the, the A minor 7 against the C, you know. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that, um, yeah, I'm just trying to process that. All right, so you're exactly right, because I noticed in the Mersey Beatles version, like, I, I don't know what the George guy is doing there, but it's clearly not right. Like, I, <laughs> like that, no, that's, that's not what they're really doing. Yeah, yeah, that, I, I couldn't find anybody that picked up on that. Um, you know, I, but, you know, I'm kind of like, when it comes to music, I'm a bit of a grammar Nazi, you know, mm -hmm. spelling Nazi, uh, is, like, I really... Well, let's put it this way. I, if you're trying to do an interpretive cover, like, give it your own flair, sure whatever play it however sure. you, it sounds right to you but if you're trying to like literally act and be like the beatles and call yourself the mersey beatles and dress up and wear the wigs and everything you might as well play what they're actually playing right yeah and i'm sure there are beatles there are a million beatles cover bands and some of them are really kind of very popular now but uh i'm sure there are a few of them that did enough research where they figured little things like that out you know some beatles people like myself can be very very picky and detailed no and, Beatles you know. fans never <laughs> <laughs> all right so uh FGC all right I mean not I mean four five one not particularly groundbreaking a minor e minor we're maintaining yeah. the same tonality These, every single chord so far has been in the key of C including the ones with the six because the six are notes from the key so nothing has strayed from the key whatsoever it's very plain vanilla it is a one four five, but he goes in the order of four or five one, which is kind of cool, you know. And typical of Beatles. I'm not going to do a one four five. But now I'll try a four five one and see what that sounds like, you know. Um, four five one meaning um, in the key of C. The first chord is C. The second chord is D minor. The third chord is E minor. Four is F. Five is G. So one four five. Which one four five were huge back in those early days. So that was everybody's written one four fives. Um, but the, you know, I think it's kind of cool and typical of the Beatles. Well, let's put a different spin on it. Let's start with the four. Nobody's done that, and there it is. You know. So there's that. Um, now get us to the B part of the A when it goes into A minor, E minor. Yeah, uh, all right, let's, right, 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 right. Uh, just one one moment. There's one other little comment I want to make about this, uh, about the uh, the little D minor, E minor that George is doing. Uh, James, you can relate to this because you're in a two-guitar band. Anybody that's in a two-guitar band, uh, there's going to come a time when you're both playing chords at the same time. So the question is, how do you offset both guitars so they sound different, you know? In my band, the blue kind, that was my job. If Mike played something down here, I'd have to play something up here against that. So it was an offset of sound. So um, that's a very, very important point for anybody that's in a two-guitar band. Don't play the same chord shapes as the other guy. Do something different. And, I, you know, I think George was very aware of that. Like, he wanted his own identity and... and uh, you know, he was kind of reaching for, hey, what about this? You know, that sort of thing. So now, all right. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> I love, I love that. It's so dramatic and so yeah. big that There's moment. something about the way it comes you in know? the upbeat that 
yeah. grabs you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And Ringo, of course, we'll talk about Ringo later, but he hits those punches. You know, he hits them hard. Uh, we'll we'll take a look at it in a minute. But, um, you know, any boring songwriter would da 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 da. <laughs> He just repeated it yeah 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 and again we have the same situation like da 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 it's so pleasing when that f major seven replaces the a minor chord we have e a minor e minor f major seven e minor so the f major seven replaces the a minor the second time around and we got the same situation here's the notes of f major seven f a c e well, A minor is A, C, E. So what we're doing is adding this one little extra color. Uh, and it's so effective. It, it's just, in fact, it comes in, it makes it bigger, you know. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Beautiful, just really beautiful. Simple little things yeah. are what makes it's the always the so great. tiny little detail that makes a huge difference. Uh, it it yeah, always blows yeah. me away. It's just the one little note, but it changes everything. It's unbelievable. And what is it that I don't know what it is that led them to be so restless? Say, well, let's not do A minor, E minor twice, you know. Uh, I don't know. Maybe somebody suggested it to John, or maybe I—I I believe John came up with that by himself, actually. Oh, to be uh, a John fly on the wall was, when they're writing these songs, huh? Oh my God! Yeah, that you know, that's why I'm so disappointed about "Let It Be" because they did the wrong session. They should have done Abbey Road or anything else, yeah. you know. Although to but be fair, it be, it's like it's like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I think observing them probably changed them, right? If they didn't yeah, have the cameras the there, case they could have been more the Beatles, perhaps. Yeah, and also waking up at six in the morning yeah, to be at the to studio by studio seven. To make... <laughs> that didn't help yeah. either. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know, if they, were, they were still partying, I'm sure, by then. And like waking up that early must have been hell for them. And what I heard, it was a cold, uncomfortable studio. It wasn't, you know... You know, and it's funny, nowadays with rock star... Well, now there's no such thing as rock stars, but... You know, as far as the 90s, when, when rock stardom was a thing, um, these guys got coddled. I mean, they get treated so well, you know. I'm sorry, I'm not going to show up at that studio at 7 in the morning unless I have, and, you know, the yeah. list of things. You know? Well, yeah, I, I, I wanted to make the observation you said earlier when the Beatles got more self-indulgent and started making longer songs. No, I think they just got more control. I mean, they were making two-minute songs because you yeah. got two minutes for this song. So you better fit it in. Yeah. You know what, James? That is leads me to one of my say sayings, that limitation breeds creativity. And we've talked about this before. And I want to relate that to the current, I don't even want to use the word, but the current situation we find ourselves in around the world at the moment, we're all very, very limited. And, and I really, really, truly feel that this limitation is going to spur on a lot of possible creativity and solutions for people. Um, I'm, I'm hoping on that. I'm hoping my theory is correct, that limitation breeds creativity. The Beatles were limited by the two-minute song, according to the record companies, you know. 2.30, maybe. Three yeah. minutes, ah, right? I like to think um, everyone's going to be locked that, down in their house, and then in a few months, and they go out, and everyone's going to be great guitar players and drummers, and <laughs> <laughs> they're all going to... It's all going to be this this outpour, <laughs> outpouring of music suddenly. Like, wow, everyone just stayed home practicing for a few months. Well, you know, I'm very surprised that I'm still teaching. My business is going. We're doing it on Skype now, and uh, as you and I always do, actually. Um, and uh, anyone out there, yeah. this is the best time ever to sign up with uh, Vinny. Just give him an email. That's right. I'll give you the coronavirus discount if you'd like. Uh, I'll take ten dollars off a lesson if you if you uh, if that helps you at all. I know things are rough right now, so I'd be happy to do that. And thank you for the plug, James. Um, okay. So anyway, uh, do we want to talk about the bridge yet? We might as well talk about the, wait, did I finish? Uh, yeah, I did yeah, finish yeah. the B. Yeah, we did the B part. So let's do the bridge. 
Oh, should we listen now, to the bridge? You know, yeah. Yeah, let's yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. Let's listen to the Mersey Beatles once again. Great. I love that. Gave me no reply. It's very, very insistent. Uh, you know, it reminds me of uh, Babies in Black. I remember watching the Beatles performance and it's got a similar punchy thing. And you can tell Paul just loves singing the harmony at the moment. And he'd move the neck of his guitar to meet the beat. You yeah. Know? yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he always yeah. was like that. Uh, um, uh, and yeah, I want to say regarding this cover. One thing I was thinking before I started looking for covers of this song, one thing I was thinking is, you know, one thing that no one's going to be able to capture is Paul's harmony. Because if you're just if you're just thinking about the song, you don't think about how how much Paul gives into that harmony. He's really screaming and he's belting it. Um, oh, and I think most yeah, people wouldn't pick up on yeah. that. But these guys do an all right job of it. Because that's one thing about the Beatles covers that you I mean, how could you sound like John and Paul? No one's going to sound like John and Paul, but that's such a key part of the sound. And especially on that, yeah. on that bridge part, um, without the Paul harmony, it just wouldn't sound anywhere near as good as it does. Yeah. Which kind of confirms my theory. I mean, when you listen to early Beatles, especially, it's not only the song. It's also the energy, the enthusiasm behind the performance. And I really feel the song is almost an appurtenance. For, to deliver that energy, you know, it's like a vehicle to deliver the energy itself. I think when people listen to music on the most raw level, what they're hearing is the energy of it. And that's what they respond to, you know, and that's why the Beatles, you know, you could watch film footage of them playing in a stadium or whatever. And uh, the excitement, you could, it's palpable. You could feel yeah. the excitement, you know. But uh, we're going to get into, we are going to get into the harmonies and Paul stuff. There's some cool things going on there. But let's look at this bridge now. If, now, one thing I found interesting is while the song begins on an F. The bridge, if I were you. Wait a second. You're sitting there on a C chord. You're going to start your bridge on the same damn chord. I was once writing a song with a friend of mine and I, I ran into that situation and he said, no, you, you can't stay on the same chord. It, you know, why not? No the interest. Did it. <laughs> why not? Beatles <laughs> no, did but it. it flows very well. <laughs> it does. And yeah. I think the good, it, the good excuse for it is that it opens on the four chord, not that C yeah. chord. So we could get away with holding it off a little longer in that section. Yeah, exactly. You because know? we're trained to want to go back to that four. But now that we're on the yep. one, even though it's the same chord, it sounds different because it's in a different context now. That's a great point. That's a great point right there. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, so let's look at the chord changes. If I were you. I, it's very nice because we're really stressing that C chord here. It's sticking around for a long time, even between the two uh, parts of the bridge. Uh, 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 and I forget. So that, that C is just sticking around for quite some time. But it gives us the relief at that moment that we, we were, you know, beginning with this F chord, uh, which doesn't sound like home base yet right so there's that now what's going on from a music theory perspective this for me is just really easy stuff we have c now finally we hit a chord that does not belong to the key of c e minor belongs to the key of c but we have an e major here a minor belongs to the key of c but we have an a major here d minor now we're back in the key of c 
and then it moves to F, which is interesting because I would have expected a 2-5, but they went. Uh, now, when I looked over some of the documentation about it, there's not much. Uh, you probably noticed not a whole lot about this song. But uh, John said that was my song. Paul had a little bit of input, and Paul admitted to that. He said, it's mostly John's. He said, but I think we worked on the bridge together, or I think I gave him some ideas for the bridge. You know, what's interesting to me is, uh, I forget what's, I think it's in this section that, even though it's it's John's voice that's carrying the melody, it, it reminds me of Lady Madonna. There's this kind of gruffness that reminds me of the way Paul sang Lady Madonna. You hear that too? Yeah. I, I, I just kind of heard that in that section. Mm. Um, anyway, so before we get into the ins and outs of the actual two lines, the counterpoint, let's look at the chords. So now uh, when we go to E, that's acting like a seventh chord, even though it's not being, uh, it's not fully Okay, uh, I, I thought it was E7. Seven. Yeah, yeah, See, yeah. if I played seventh, that's those are seventh chords. They're not painful. You know that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but what we're doing is softening the seventh by just doing pure major instead. Okay. So, but from a music theory standpoint, E is covering for E seven. And E7 is the sec a secondary dominant chord that would have gone to the A minor chord. Except we're not going to the A minor chord. We're going to the A major chord. And this uh, is a moment of movement and force. When we get to the E, we're moving in intervals of force, which uh, any classical um, uh, teacher will tell you that Movement and force is the strongest mu bass movement in music. You could you could feel one note's leading to the other, leading to there, and bringing it finally back home, right? Uh, a, a a big example would be that's all fourths. Now, somebody would argue to me, oh, well, you moved a fifth over here. Well, a fifth is an inverted fourth, so it's the same thing. All right. Uh, so there's that. I mean, uh, E7 would have gone to A minor, and A7, instead it goes to A major, and A major is acting like an A7, which does go to the D minor. So this is, E is 5-7 of the sixth chord of the key of C, so we call it 5-7 of six. And A is the uh, five seven of the two chord of the right. key of C. Yeah, right. That's, so that's the way I was thinking. There. It's not that the E. I, I am not thinking of it in movement and fourths. I'm thinking of it as the secondary dominant five seven six moving to the five seven two to. Uh, D. Yeah, yeah. Well, the two go hand in hand, and you could do an entire string mm. of of secondary dominance, like not giving you. Mm the chord it was supposed to go to, but replacing it mm. with another secondary dominant, right. and then not going to the chord it was supposed to, but replacing it. Like the song Mr. Sandman does that. I have an A7, right? That's 5-7 of uh, 3. But instead, the 3 becomes a dominant 7. And D7 would have gone to G minor, but it goes to G7. And uh, G7 would have gone to C minor, but it goes to C7. So an exaggerated form of this is this. Real, that's the longest string you can make, by the way, of, of secondary dominance. So, and that's all movement in force, it's all seventh chords, you know, one suggesting the other. Yeah, one moving to the other. All right, so, um, so that's pretty much that. D, D minor, um, which I'm so we're F. still in C, so that would be the two. So we're going from the five seven uh, yeah, two to the two to the F, which would be the four, back to the C, which is the one. Is that the way we're interpreting this? Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely, yeah. And and by the way, I mean, even though you're using chords from out of the key, that does not mean you're modulating necessarily, mm. because all these chords are implying a movement to one of the chords inside the key. It's keeping you there. Yeah. You know, it just keeps keeping you there. Even Mr. Sandman does that. You can hear eventually that you could go that you're going to go back to this right? and back home. So, in a sense, the, so, the the verse part is rooted in the F. And then the bridge part is rooted in the C. Well, I wouldn't say rooted because that's a very specific term, meaning that that's the the where you you kind of feel like you ended a mm. phrase or whatever. Okay. Obviously, the F doesn't feel like you've ended, but rooted in the sense of focused on, you know, or highlighted. Yeah, definitely. Okay, definitely. Yeah, if we were rooted on the F, that'd be a whole different ball game. It would be like very weird. It'd be Lydian. And, uh, yeah, yeah, okay. more exotic kind of sound. All right. So now why don't we take a look at the, the harmonies and the counterpoint? Now, I honestly, like I, you know, I'm flying by the seat of my pants here and I didn't do a deep, deep, like memorized, perfect type of thing at this point, but we can look at it. Um, so obviously on the verse, we don't have any harmony on the first part of the verse. You know, da -da 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 -da. What what is the wow, I'm forgetting what the first melody is. Da 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 You once asked me, uh, you have a penchant for asking me, like, cool questions. And one of the questions you once asked me, maybe early on, you said, when we, you know, like listening to the Beatles, for example, how do you determine which is the actual melody that's being stated and which is the actual harmony? Now, this is an interesting case because it's kind of switching back and forth. John, obviously, is mostly carrying melody here. But when, wouldn't you say that the melody for this part is... Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. Well, this is interesting because what John does, a classic John, one note line. Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah. Now, you, you know, I was skeptical too. You put a moment of skeptical look on your mm -hmm. face. I was skeptical too. But I listened very closely. And here's why it sounds like John. If you listen closely to that one moment, it sounds like his, the melody is moving in his voice. But I really, really looked into it, and it's he's really just doing da 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 da. -da. And by the way, that's nice because it's the major seventh of the major seven chord. Da -da -da -da. That's really lovely right there. But I think what happened was John sang da 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 in the demonstration of the song, and he probably couldn't hit it. Yeah. So yeah, it sounds more like a Paul, Paul thing, like, yeah, clearly Paul. Right. Can that, right? Yeah. Way high up there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And Paul, of course, was always comfortable in those high ranges. So here's the thing. Uh, let me see if I could emulate this. All right. Well, you know, hold on. You're a you're a aficionado of the anthology uh videos right yeah i i'm going off memory here but i would be willing to bet there's outtakes from no reply in the anthology where i'm sure you could hear john mess up trying to do that i remember that da, 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 oh okay. fucking hell you know whatever <laughs> oh outtake. maybe so yeah 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 yeah, yeah that's right right, right? so paul had a tail oh brilliant james yeah. brilliant absolutely yeah. absolutely like that I remember that outtake. Yeah. I remember because they cracked up laughing at yeah, one point. Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that moment. Yeah, yeah. So how Paul insane are we it. that we remember <laughs> outtakes <laughs> like that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, here, when you said that, I'm like, yeah, John, John did crack that, and so they gave it to Paul. Yeah, of course. I'm sure there's a number of people out there who watch these videos who just get pissed <laughs> off at us for being so picky <laughs> <laughs> That's why they love us, Vinny. <laughs> All 
All right, so now, when you think of Paul singing, right, he starts on the same note John starts on. Da. Then he sings, John stays on this note, Paul goes up. Da. Then they both come back to the same note again. Right? Um, so there's that classic Beatles um, harmony, too, the fourths. They weren't afraid of fourths. It's not as harmonious as a third, but it, it kind of character, characterized a lot of their music. I talk about, in classical music, they talk about voice leading. That's a classical term. It has to do with counterpoint. And basically, when you have one melody and you want to harmonize it, you better be aware of the chord coming up next because whatever the harmony melody has to take a chord tone. And in this case, it did. Uh, anyway, if I put the two parts together, you get this. And it's so uncanny, man. Do, do take a moment to listen to it. because If you listen to John's voice, it sounds like he's moving, mm -hmm. but he isn't. Yeah. It's really kind of cool. It is. Yeah. yeah there's something about... I've always loved this song, and it's hard to put your oh. finger on it, but there's something about that sound. It's so, yeah. it's so poignant. I don't know. There's like you feel the emotion from oh, that, yeah. the way that the that melody and harmony blend. Mm -hmm. There's, I mean, it yes, really it is. is powerful. Yeah, yeah. So we have that section now. The the Lady Madonna part now the B section. If I were you, I'd realize that I. All right, you hear that one note? That I. That's the third of the A chord. And you notice how, like, it stands out. It, it's definitely not in the key, that note, you know. And in fact, in the A chord, the only note that's not in the key of C is that note. And the other two notes of A long right key. Is... No. No. Uh, before I jump to that, let me. No, because the blues works in reverse. Yeah, it's not minor it, over major. It's major over minor. Yeah. It's major over minor. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the reverse is actually when you experiment with uh, minor over major, it's horrifying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's really bad. You know, it's like, uh, here's E minor. And I put in the major note in. <laughs> where if I take an E major, yeah. I'm not good. There you get the blues. Yeah. Major yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so there's that. So we have the harmonies now. Now, interesting point, like in the um, the bridge. If, uh, you know what? Um, if I were you, could you play that? The those guys doing the yep. bridge? Do they sing the harmonies? Uh, let's see. Hold on. Wow. Yeah, this is really cool. This is an example of voice leading. First, they're in thirds. Right? So the first part. Now, he could have gone down. Oh, yeah. I can't sing that high. Um, Wait. He could have gone down, okay, but he chose to go up. And that's awesome yeah. right there. And yeah, and, exactly. Who would think to do that and who could pull that off? I mean, it's 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 not easy. Yeah. Now, bear in mind, you know, like, if you have a note, you could harmonize it in thirds from below. Um, here's my note. And I harmonize a third below of the note from the key. Or I could harmonize above. All right? 
But the two yield different results. If I play a C chord and I hit, I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get the sixth. But if I, when I was above, I'm gonna get the perfect chord tone. Right. Uh, so what I'm trying to say here is that even, all right, you'd think because um, that's all thirds in parallel. And you would think this isn't a third. It isn't a third, it's a sixth. But a sixth is a third upside down. So if I take this A note and bring it down an octave, I get a third. All right? So, I mean, it just it worked out very well. And I think Paul chose, he could have gone down, like I said, but he chose that high note to put that extra bit of juice into yeah. it. It's much more exciting when you hear it yeah, go exactly. up. Exactly. You know? Yeah, that, that, that always sticks out when you hear it. It's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely yep. puts the juice in. And we're still like, there's no fourths in there. It's six and thirds are the same thing, really. So what we're hearing is that same kind of, um, how do you put it? Like thirds have a very, I've been searching for a word for years for this, how thirds sound. They sound very sing-song. They sound very chimey. They ring together. It's hard to describe it, but they, they don't have the hollowness of fifths or fourths. Those ring together. It sounds more folk, folksy. Maybe, Fifths maybe. sound more uh, Gregorian or something to me. I don't know. I'm just describing the the feeling well, you, you talk about the harmonies that are not thirds because the gregorian is yeah, yeah that's what so i'm gregorian uh, yeah, that's what i'm saying fifth is kind of oh yeah yeah medieval like gregorian. Sound, right oh yeah look i could go and do it in thirds but if i do it in fifth oh yeah that's gregorian chant right there yeah, 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 yeah. very boring music no harmony no rhythm yeah Whew. Glad I didn't live in those days. <laughs> oh, boy. Um, all right. So, you know, we covered the harmonies. We covered the two guitar parts. Um, let's talk a little about production. And well, tell George me about Martin, drumming as well, because you said there was an interesting drumming here. Really? Yeah, there's this interesting stuff to talk about. I'm really impressed. All right. So uh, let me see. There's like a steady tempo, right? And the Latin clave rhythm, wait, I have to, I'm, I could only do it this way. Wait, let me get a different tone. Um, right? Right, dot, 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 dot. Um, that's what Ringer's. He's following, like, like, look, man. In music school, you, you study Latin rhythms. You know, that's a thing, and that's this is called the clave part. Dot, 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 dot. Right, or dot, 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 dot. Shaving a haircut, dot, two dot. bits. Dot, 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 dot. Not quite. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. no. Um, I, I get what you're saying. Yeah, I get it. Dot, 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 dot. Well, Ringo is doing that on the snare drum. Dot, dot, dot. Which is very interesting because I wouldn't think that that's a thing that you have to have a little bit of training as a drummer to know even what that is. You know? Like, for example, there's an African rhythm that goes uh, dot, 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 dot. That's called the bell rhythm. The Latin one is called the clave rhythm. Two two uh, wooden, uh, you know, two wooden things <laughs> together. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of the word. They're tube-like. You know, they yeah, look like tubes. I get you. Tubes. You know. Um, anyway, so yeah, I'm very surprised that Ringo knew, uh, knew about that. Now, amongst other things, too, is <clears throat> 
when we talk about Ringo, that, that kind of like rolls into some of the production. And by the way, this is such a well-produced piece of work. Martin did a great job with it. Um, now, they all recognized, every single one of them in that room recognized when they did this. Those accents. Notice they're all upstrokes, upbeats, right? Um, I think they recognize this is very dramatic here. Let's let's add to the drama. Let's let's build it here. Martin and all of his brilliance chose to just hit the bass notes on the piano in octaves. Bam, right? Uh, it's actually. A Um, and it just like you could I, at first I thought it was an electric piano because it was so resonant, but it's definitely an acoustic piano. And then when we go into the bridge, da -da, he goes into rock and roll piano. He's playing on the piano, yeah. which is uh, and they did, they actually did. I can't believe they did this, but I guess it was a thing. They 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 did the hand claps. They. Yep, 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 yep. Which that is stuck kind out of for ridiculous. Me when I was listening. Yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. Got the claps that's in a, there. That was a George Martin thing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let's see. How about the uh, just a couple outro? Of... Tell us about the outro. Oh yeah. <laughs> I know the, you hate the, that word. The <laughs> oh, you and your fancy words. It's an outro. <laughs> Well, it's a tiny little coda, so we could call it a codita. Oh, right, uh, an outrito. <laughs> <laughs> so da 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 Yeah, that always yeah. stuck out to me. I'm always like, what a weird chord to end on. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I, yeah, I really it, love it. It is. It works, That's, but it's so jarringly. Whoa. It's one of those chords that they took from that jazz guitar teacher they went to. And, <laughs> For two you know, two oh, lessons. let's do yeah. this jazz chord. You know. It's a C6-9. It contains... Um, it's operating as a C chord. It could have ended... Uh, Could have ended on C. Yeah, absolutely. But this mm. gives it that loungy. You yeah. know, the Beatles, they did a lot of loungy stuff in those days. So, yeah, so C69, what does 69 mean? Mm. I went up the C scale. <laughs> I hope no one takes that out of context and edits it. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> We're going to C69 soon? <laughs> 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 Whoever thought these conversations would be so exciting. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you brought that up. So the ending is cool. Um, and again, John does the one note thing. And Paul does. Yeah. Okay, here's and my... This case... Oh, please, yeah. Sorry. No, I was going to say, in this particular case... Um, where John is holding the pedal point. Hear that harmony? That's not a third. That's a fourth. Um, and they did fourths very well. Believe it or not, it's hard to sing fourths. It's, it's harder to sing fourths and fifths than it is thirds, at least from my experience. But then I'm a loud singer. Somebody commented on one of my recent videos, hey, you should sing. I was like, ha, 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 I think you have a good Joe Jackson voice, but... Yeah, yeah in a range of a fifth and yeah. my you know i could hear everything perfectly in my head but when it tries to translate through my vocal cords it's scary it's a different instrument you see me try to I, yeah it is well i'm not one to talk i'm not a singer myself um let's so uh 
uh, here's my speculation. Uh, when you say, I didn't actually read about that, but it certainly makes sense that Paul held out on that bridge because uh, it's definitely a change in mood of the song. And it's definitely oh, yeah. more brighter, shall we say. Um, Paul brings some of the yang to John's yin, I think. Because it's a, it's te textually, lyrically, emotionally, it's a pretty dark song. But then the, for the bridge, it kind of lifts up a little bit and, you know, which, uh, you know, relieves some of the, the darkness, I guess. Um, and I, so I would similarly really? speculate that that C69, I'm, I'm thinking Paul might have slipped that in. Because that doesn't seem to me like John's instinct to end there. I, yeah, yeah, not John. You know what? I'm, I would bet that it was George's idea. Uh -huh. Could be. Which George? Because he was, you know, Which until George? they were... <laughs> no, George uh, Harrison. Okay. And I was so amazed to see... Uh, never heard them ringing, I never... I was mind-blown when I saw George do this. Yo, dude, where'd you learn that chord? Where'd you learn that chord? Good dog. Good dog. Awesome. Uh, so to me, it, it's like, I think George had an interest in those kind of jazz, jazz chords. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was his suggestion. Yeah. Like he said, you know, like, yeah. guys, what about this? Yeah, you know? yeah actually, that probably, but definitely, yeah, that makes more sense, actually. I agree. Definitely not, John. You're 100% right about that. Yeah. Uh, one more thing about the production part. Ringo's, <laughs> I found a mistake. And what he does is, if you listen to the ending song, the ending of the song, you know he's doing those big punches with the cymbals, da 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 ba, ba ba da da ba. You know he's really, really dramatizing it. Well, in the codita, um, he comes in like a bar early, early with a hit. It's just like out of nowhere. It doesn't. None of the other musicians are are hitting the accent. And probably, I think it was a mistake. He was expecting. The verse took the uh, part to come in sooner than it did. Let me see if I could figure it out. I thought I almost thought I figured it out earlier, but I didn't spend much time. Um, um, da, 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 da. Yeah, somewhere in there. Da, 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 da. Oh, yeah, da, 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 da. yeah, he does it early, you yeah. know. I've never and consciously noticed was, that, but yeah, yeah interesting. I, th I think it was a fortuitous little mistake. And maybe he made the, had made the mistake in earlier takes, and they all said, you know what, keep that there. That's kind of cool, you know? Yeah. Interesting. So the last bit is the lyric. And a uh, good point, because, you know, you brought up John's dark darkness, you know? And... Uh, he, what I found interesting about John is that he was not afraid to use themes of death in his so early songs, you know. Now, granted, there was kind of a teen fascination with uh, some, like a Romeo and Juliet type thing where, oh, your lover dies and oh, you know, the melodrama of it. And I think he was picking up on some of that. But, you know, he was deeply affected by his mother's death. And that was on his mind. It was on his mind, you know. Um. Now, you know what I find interesting, though, is, you know, I just uh, looked at, saw a picture of them during the psychedelic period, and John looks so pleased and happy, like, you know, he found God on one of his trips or something like that, you know. And I thought, wow, you know, it must have been hard for him to transfer his dark side into this kind of happy, hippie, love everything thing, you know. It must have taken a ton of ass for him to, like, change like that, you know. It's a big, big change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, something that really stuck out for me that uh, um, Lewison said, Mark Lewison, was uh, he said, he, I could write a, a, a story about the John Lennon of like the early 60s getting into bar brawls and beating his girlfriend and that. And it the story would end in the mid 70s where he's, you know, bed in for peace and leading feminist marches and stuff. That's a fascinating story. And yeah, unfortunately, yeah. the tendency in the last, especially in the last decade or so, has been to reduce it all down to John Lennon was a hypocritical woman beater. 
and you know he was right, a right, right, horrible right, person right, yeah, yeah he yeah. had absolutely horrible things in him he also had other tendencies and that that black and white and the dualism and the, the clash is much more interesting a story than he was terrible he was despicable or he was all this imagined floating on the clouds kind of David right. person no he was a human being with a lot of conflict he was a, but... and he was he was the first to say that he was the first to say hey you know he was always like kind of chopping down the Beatles were just an image they were just like this big glitzy image that four regular guys were behind we were just regular guys he kept harping on that you know uh, so there's that, you know, um, Babies in Black is another song that, you know, about death and yeah. that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. That's One other thing song. I want to... <laughs> I love it. Oh, yeah, I yeah. love that song. Yeah. I really do love that song. Yeah. I love when they do it live, too. It's so exciting. Mm. Uh, just one other thing I want to mention is just... I don't know if this is a British thing, like just the classiness of the way Brits speak English as opposed to Americans or whatever, but, um, you know, it would have been... It would have been an easy, easy to come up with the title "No Answer." I'm, you know, I'm not getting an answer, but instead it's "No Reply." Not again, not a second time. There's this kind of like way, just very, very subtle again, but this way of making it just slightly cooler and slightly classy, yeah. classier. Well, you might be in a better position to know this, but I was assuming this is kind of picking up on the lingo of the telephone, which would have been au courant at the time, reply rather than answer. And maybe it's an English, British English versus American English thing. But I would assume that no answer probably was not more, I, I don't know. It doesn't sound very British to me. Yeah, yeah, uh, right, right, exactly. But, uh, you know, in America, I, no answer was perfectly fine, yeah, yeah. you know, even in those days, no. you know, they didn't remember, answer the phone. I'm just going off the top of my head here, but I remember reading about this song a long time ago. And they said they were trying to make some sort of observation like, you know, when the Beatles were growing up in war ravaged Liverpool in the 50s, you know, like they didn't they didn't have that. They wouldn't have had a telephone in their home. You know, they wouldn't have this. This is not wow. part of their childhood. They're growing up. But yeah. so they're trying to write these songs as if they were teenagers growing up in the 60s when they're already in their 20s. And they're trying mm -hmm. to connect to this, you know, like because no reply and things like, you know, no one. No one's using telephones in the fifties, right? In Liverpool, right? right? But in America, yeah, in America, in America, exactly. They were trying they to connect were, right? to the, the what the kids were doing, right? And John took his inspiration from a fifties song. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, right. I went uh, strolling by, uh, walking by your house late last. There's two silhouettes in the shade. Da, da, da. Another one six four five song. Uh, right. Right. The inspiration was that he said he said that, like, you know, he had this image of seeing the girl in the window, but, you know, not responding him, to him. So his heart breaks because, you know, so um, he probably, you know, got it from some American stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think there's a telephone in Silhouette on in the shade or whatever that song is. Right. But, uh, you know, he could have just picked up on that Americans already had the technology or something yeah, and was kind of, yeah. cause you know, don't forget. I mean, they were, they were, in a sense, they were an American influenced band, you know, yeah. in a sense, you yeah. know, they're, yeah, yeah. they're trying to do American music really, yeah. you know? Yeah. I always thought that was interesting cause I don't really think of it from that perspective, but yeah, these were essentially, I mean, there was a big difference between the 20 something year old Brits that they were and the teenage Americans they were hoping to reach. Yeah, and I would say back in the, at least when America was not despicable, that the Brits had a kind of love affair with America. They were, I, I think they still have a certain fascination with us, you know, in the sense well, that... Well, that was something, uh, yeah, I, and you may, like, people may poo-poo that, but if you actually read, like, uh, you know, their biographies or listen to their interviews, no, they always said America was it. Like, that was, anything from America was cool, we wanted to be like that. Right. That's what they said. And can you imagine... Can you imagine not just America, but New York City yeah, in America? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. that that was huge for those guys. He, they, you know, Ringo even said, you know, it's like this. All our heroes were from New York. You know, it's like wow. I never understand Ringo's comment about, I, you know, when they were flying into New York. He said he pictured like he was in a some sort of a like science a movie, movie and the but, octopus is sort of drawing them in or whatever. Yeah, we yeah, come out of the ocean and grab the plane. Yeah. I don't know why he thought that, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> oh, well, now we're just reminiscing on random snippets from the anthology and stuff. Random so, thing. Is yeah. there anything yeah. else to say about No Reply? Uh, no, and James, I thought this was going to be short. Have we gone over? <laughs> it's an hour. hour. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever's with us at this point is in it for the long haul, I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, yeah, it was There's a lot no of fun. One. Once again, had a great time. Okay. And, and uh, uh, just to get everyone's thinking caps on for our next conversation, the next one in the discography would be Help. Oh, Help. Oh, good, good, good. Well, yeah, let's that's set our exciting. Sights on that's a song from Help. And obviously, if you have a suggestion, please leave it in the comments, but we may not do it. <laughs> we may not we do may. it. It, it yeah. has to kind of like move both of us. Yeah, you know, we'll that's a, that's the thing. Yeah. However, Help is such a that's a rich album. There might, mm. you know. Yeah. And you know, let's let's some... yeah, I always want to try to do a non-obvious choice. So maybe we'll avoid the title track, mm -hmm. but yeah. Well, let's think about it. Oh. Well, I wanted to do that. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the title track. <laughs> you had me for a Title track is great. Oh, it's a uh, you know, perfect song. It's great. Yeah, yeah George. Doing that line and help yeah. is yeah. really great stuff. Cool. All right. Well, we'll definitely have fun with that. So, anyway, to anyone who yeah. is still listening to us, thank you. <laughs> yeah, just a quick mention, too. Um, on my, I made a new playlist on my channel called. Uh, uh, live streaming. Uh, it's bas basically <laughs> what, I, what I've taken to is doing live streaming on Facebook. Um, and it's been really my, the response has been tremendous to what I'm doing. So I thought I would share it on my YouTube channel. And alas, I'd love to do live streaming on YouTube, but I do not have a thousand subscribers yet. So I can't do it. Um, Come on, guys. Let's get him up. So um, yeah. For the record, it's Love is Contagious, the live stream home concert co-video series. Co-video. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Copyright, trademark. Vinny Kanjiano, yeah. 2020. Yeah, 2020. To hell with 2020. Mm. May it go away quick. Mm. Although I, I'm wondering about 21 and 22. Yeah, you know, but, I, okay. I don't know if we're heading in the right direction. But anyway... That's a whole other conversation, but we're talking Beatles, uh, so let's leave on a happy note. We're talking Beatles. By the way, the Beatles, if you're worried about getting sick, the Beatles are the cure for everything. Trust me on that. Yeah. Right, James? Yeah, exactly. The Beatles cured my cancer. No, okay. Uh, maybe I'm not allowed to say that. That's That would be against <laughs> FDA guidelines or something. Uh, yeah, so right. before we go, uh, if people are interested in Skype lessons from you, how would they do that? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, uh, you can email me. The easiest one is Vincognito. It's like incognito, but with a V, uh, just like it is on my YouTube channel. And uh, But one word, vincognito at gmail.com. Um, or my Skype handle is also vincognito. I mean, really, you know, my whole life story, if you search vincognito on Google, you pretty much own me at that point. So, Excellent. All right. Well, then let's do it again next month. All right, take care, James. It was a lot of fun. Be well. Stay safe.